You can view all of our programs on CMC alumni, cmc.edu slash alumni or cmc.edu slash parents, uh, where we have a, um, a history of wine tastings, faculty lectures, um, and other presentations uh, that are that have been a lot of fun to host over the last um, few months. Uh, Erica will talk a little bit more about uh, where we currently stand with athletics, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure you all know that unfortunately, um, all of our students are remote this semester as they were last semester. CMC is ready to return our students to campus as soon as we are permitted by LA County. We worked very hard to create a, a, an incredible CMC returns plan. We want our students in person for classes and in, in person for competition as soon as humanly possible. So with that, it's my pleasure to turn uh, the program over to our, uh, our uh, to Erica Perkins Jasper, the William B. R. C. Director of Athletics, Physical Education and Recreation and George R. Roberts Fellow. Erica, it's great to have you here. Thanks so much for moderating our panel today. Uh, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Evan, and thanks for the wonderful introduction and for inviting us to be here this afternoon or evening or early if you're in Hawaii. Um, in addition to our student athletes, um, obviously one of our greatest assets as a department and one of the things that really blew me away um, from when I interviewed for this job to when I started about a year and a half ago are incredible coaches and the history of success of all of our athletic programs. Um, we all benefit on a daily basis from getting to interact with some of these people who truly are champions in the trade. As you can imagine, as a former coach myself and for the rest of our uh, coaches on our staff, everybody wakes up thinking about maybe winning a national championship. And um, one of the things that we have that not many athletic departments in the country have is we have four active head coaches who have won NCAA titles. Um, so tonight is a fun opportunity to share them and hopefully a bit of their magic with you. Um, as I saw in the chat and from some of the intros, probably none of them need an introduction with this group. However, I've been tasked with it, so I will do my best, um, knowing that probably a proper introduction of each one of them could fill our hour session. So I promise that I will not do that. Um, going first uh, is Jody Burton. Jody is our head coach for women's golf and professor of physical education. Jody's in her 15th season as our golf coach, and her career also includes 31 years of coaching women's basketball at CMS. And I also believe there's been stints in coaching volleyball and also some interim duties as the tennis coach. Um, Jody's 2018 team captured the NCAA team title, winning an exciting and maybe stressful, she'll tell you a little bit about that fashion in a two hole playoff. Our second coach joining us tonight is Dave Schwartz. Dave is in his seventh season as head coach for women's tennis and associate professor of Physi physical education. Dave guided the Athenas to a 2018 NCAA title here at home at the Byzance Family Tennis Center. However, that was not the first NCAA title for coach Schwartz who won two titles as the men's tennis coach at Middlebury. Dave was the fifth tennis coach to win NCAA titles in both men's and women's tennis. And he's actually the only coach to do it at two different institutions. So that's pretty cool. Sticking with the tennis theme, our next panelist is Paul Settles. Paul is in his 17th season as the head coach of the Stags and associate professor of physical education. Paul coached our men's tennis team to the 2015 title, which was the first NCAA title for CMS in 34 years. Stag men's tennis currently holds a 135 match win streak in conference play. Unbelievable. Our final coach panelist is Kurt Vlasic. Kurt is the head volleyball coach for the Athenas as an, in an, and is an assistant professor for physical education. Kurt is in his ninth season as head coach, but began coaching at CMS as an assistant in 2002. He's also a Claremont, California native. His 2017 volleyball team took home the NCAA title and tipped off what would be a three title academic year for the Athenas with the championships in golf and tennis to follow that season. Coaches, thank you for joining us. And now on to the question. As Evan said, um, feel free to put questions into the chat and we'll also open up some time for you to raise your hand virtually and ask questions of our panel as we move through. So I told Jody that I would pick on her first. Jody, are you ready? When did you realize that this team in 2018 was capable of winning it all? And what were the keys to them winning? First, I have to unmute, right? Um, there you go. I knew uh, I knew in the fall of the first tournament that we were gonna that we could potentially we had the talent to win a national championship, and so that was that was exciting. But before I I kind of go on that uh, the 
the journey to winning a championship um, uh, is more than just that one year, right? And uh, credit needs to be uh, uh, to those who started the program, those who stuck with it when we weren't very good, and uh, then also those that were uh, uh, made us better, helped us continue to get better throughout throughout the until 2018, right? And uh, the the uh, yeah, that, that's probably enough about that. But, oh, but you know, and then, and then I also, before I go on, I, I, I got to give credit to my uh, entire roster because in golf, you only play five, five to six players. Sometimes you can get seven or eight in there with individuals, but um, uh, those, you leave them. They don't get to travel like in basketball. You leave them and uh, they stay at home. And uh, I think one of the reasons we were so successful was because those people were so positive. They were every bit as excited when we won as the players that played in that tournament. So uh, if any of them are on here, a shout out to them because without you, we wouldn't have won either, right? So um, uh, so after that first tournament, I knew that the, the returners were strong. Uh, the first years were talented and uh, they, they didn't succumb to the pressure. Um, we, had a, we had a really good first tournament and, and continued that way. Uh, we had all the physical components uh, uh, that you need that I, and the team was already starting to blend. Our uh, fall season was solid. Our spring season was exceptional. And, and we're very grateful to be at, at uh, CMS because the administration um, and the donations uh, allow us to travel. And we, uh, we got to go to Jekyll, which is a premier tournament in the nation. And we got to go to Arizona and they had top 15 teams as well. And then Palm Desert, and these are all stay overnights. Um, and they had exceptional talent. And I, and I think you need to play the, the best to, to try to have a chance to win uh, against the best. So then we, uh, so then we headed into the championship. We were ranked number two because we'd won everything in the spring. And we probably should have been number one. Our region voted us number one. And uh, they, they kept George Fox at number one. And to be honest, I was very grateful to be going into the tournament as number two and not, not number one. I've been there enough. I've seen, I've seen a lot of not, number ones not win. So I was very, very glad. Uh, we had five players that got on that plane in Florida. One was uh, senior Margaret Lonke. She also won the national championship individual, not just the team. We had Kelly Ransom, who was a junior, Emma Kane, who was a sophomore, uh, Mira Yu and, and Emily Ate were first year students. Uh, we were a talented bunch. Uh, our chemistry was outstanding. Our team leaders were phenomenal. Um, we had great parents. That's important too. Um, good food, good snacks, plenty of water and drinks, all those things that, that make for a, a uh, potential national championship. And, uh, and during the spring with each uh, tournament, I grew uh, a little bit more confident, but we, we never really talked about as a team about winning a national championship. We just went from tournament to tournament to tournament and, and just prepared for those. And so when we were on our way, we got delayed in, I don't know, some, some airport, probably Houston or Dallas. And we were all sitting together eating and uh, I was telling him about my son, Michael, and he wanted to come. And actually, so did my son, John, right? And uh, I told Michael, no, it's too far. It's too expensive. There's no housing. And, uh, and he said to me, but you have a chance to win, right? And I said, yes. So that's the only time we talked about winning a national championship. But I, I, I'm sure the players, if they're on the phone, they would probably say that they talked about it more than more than that. But I didn't. I'm a little bit superstitious. Maybe a lot. I love it, Jody. <laughs> so um, we got we got there, um, and and the one thing that my team does at every tournament, or that team did, every every team has their own kind of way to prep. And uh, this team, they really enjoyed being together. They smiled, they laughed, they sang songs on the practice range, irritated other people because of that, uh, rocked out in the van there. And once we got there and we had a little tradition that I would get out and go get the, 
the coaching cart um, and I would give them their time in the van and it would rock and they would be playing music that I probably didn't want to hear. And Marge and Kelly did a, just a superb job of pumping up that team, of relaxing that team and getting them, them focused and ready to play. And uh, the, the last thing um, uh, about winning is, is you need to be lucky. And so here are some examples of that. So we played, first day we were ahead, second day we were ahead, third day we were ahead, going in the fourth day we were ahead. We go three holes into it and uh, Williams is now ahead, right? We, they had a phenomenal, and Williams in all, and they had three of their players that that was their home course when they were in high school. So they had a little bit of advantage and we had only played it when we got there, right? So um, Williams was ahead, then we made the turn and Williams was still ahead and probably about 15 or so last time I checked, Williams was still ahead. And then we had a couple of unique things happen. We had uh, um, Emma Kane, well, not unique, but Emma Kane uh, birdied the 17th because we were probably down by three or so. She birdied it. Um, Mira, Mira Yu, the, the Williams player she was playing with, uh, landed about a foot from the hole for a birdie. She was off in the trees or something. She was way out there. And she chipped it, went in, birdie. And uh, Kelly's player hit it in the water. And so uh, we picked up three strokes. We ended up tied at the end. Then went into uh, um, the playoff holes and uh, st still not feeling confident. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I knew we were in it, but you never felt like you were really going to win it until it was, it was over, right? But uh, um, in the playoff, it was, the, the playoff was, uh, suspenseful. We had to go two rounds of it. There must have been five or 600 people hanging around that green and cheering mostly for us because uh, we were the unknown, I think. And uh, um, we ended up March. Marge, uh, so we went through the second round and Marge was, we're tied. Marge and the Williams player are up. Marge barely hits it over the water barely she lands in the junk right next to the water hits it out of that comes up short so and it's par four she chips on maybe she was a little nervous i don't know you'd have to ask her but um trip chips up she's 15 feet from williams went to the left of the green but they chipped within six feet and uh marge steps up and just nails it so now we know for sure we'll tie and uh um the Williams player had landed a golf ball size away from going in. And so you, you got to be lucky. I really think uh, when you get to national championships, you got to be lucky. But that's it. Thanks, Jody. And I think Marge has maybe joined us tonight. So we'll have to maybe ask her a question later and see if she can uh, validate the nerves there. Um, there's lots of positives, and Jody did a nice job talking about all the great things that do happen in a championship season, but championship seasons and runs usually have more bumps in the road than I think people realize. So for Paul, was there a time that you were worried that that opportunity to win the title might slip away for you in 2015? Yeah, first, um, just a shout out to uh, all of the Stags tennis uh, family, friends, and alums who are on the Zoom today. It's awesome to see you in this uh, matrix of, uh, of a Hollywood Squares type game that we're playing right now. So um, great to see everybody's faces. Um, but Eric, to answer your question, um, you know, that, that 2015 team was pretty spectacular. Uh, you know, if, if you go back and you, you look at the schedule as I've done the last couple of days and, and see the teams that we beat in our division and division three, um, no one was really ever close to us that year. I mean, we, we really dominated the division. And, you know, the reason why was uh, our top three, uh, you know, made up the, the Mount Rushmore of uh, Stags tennis players, uh, Warren Wood, uh, Skylar Butts, who's on from Hong Kong right now, and, um, and Nick Marino at number three, uh, three guys who are among the best in the program. Uh, leading the way. Um, and uh, yeah, from pole to pole, this team was really, really strong. 
Um, but nevertheless, I fretted the entire season. Um, I, in my mind, I imagined uh, the worst happening, uh, an injury to one of our top guys, uh, something happening off court. Um, and yet uh, we stayed healthy. Uh, we stayed on task. Uh, we had a phenomenal year. And yet there, there were still a couple of glimpses where I thought, wow, we might not be able to pull this off. And uh, maybe the, the first place that started was uh, when Joe Dorn uh, approached me before the season started and said, hey, coach, uh, Warren Wood and I are, are a great team, but I think, I think we could be even better if we split up and played with other players. And I looked at, at Joe and I said, you're crazy. <laughs> that is not going to happen. You guys are a team and you're sticking together. And um, fortunately, uh, five months later, that was validated uh, in Cincinnati when they, they won the NCAA doubles title uh, and led us to a team victory. Uh, but that was a moment where I thought I, I had some uncertainty about our path forward. Um, the other thing which is interesting about that year, you know, everybody remembers that, that Warren won the Triple Crown, uh, led us to a team title, uh, won the singles and doubles, and yet early in the season, he had a couple of losses uh, where he proved that he was, he was mortal, that he might not actually make it to Mount Rushmore. Um, he had a, a, an early season loss, I think, in the season opener against uh, Bates. Um, uh, he had a loss uh, at Hopkins uh, when we did an East Coast trip later in, in the year. Um, so uh, Nick also had a loss early in the season. Um, Skyler had a loss in there also to Brandeis unexpectedly. Um, sorry, Skyler, I had to, had to bring that up. Um, so despite having this incredibly deep, talented team, we, we still had some glimpses that, hey, we still needed to be great on the day. And certainly having gotten to the NCAA finals in 2013 and 2014, uh, we knew we had to be good on the last day. Um, so that, that was the, the concern going forward. But really at the division three level, um, our only real hints that, that maybe we might not pull this off uh, came against our, our rivals across the street. And it was such a strange year, 2015, because we ended up playing Pomona Pitzer uh, four times that year, uh, which is very unusual. And they happened to be, have their best team maybe in, in the history of their program. Uh, they finished the year at number four in the country. Uh, when we played them, I think all four times they were ranked number three in the country. Uh, and on two of those occasions, we went across the street uh, in our first Skyac match against them, second of the year. We had beaten them at, at the Stag Hen, uh, and we went down 2-1 after doubles. And uh, that was a moment where I thought, well, if we don't pull it together against a strong rival team, uh, we, may not, we may not be able to do it. Uh, that happened again um, in the Skyac uh, team final. Um, we played that match at Pasadena, Pasadena City College. Uh, Caltech was hosting, went down 2-1 after doubles, but then uh, really stepped up in the singles and won. The last sort of glimpse of, hey, this might not work out the way we all envisioned it, uh, actually happened in Cincinnati in the quarterfinals. Same thing happened. We went down 2-1 uh, uh, in the quarterfinals against Hopkins. Um, and actually lost a singles match uh, relatively early in the singles where it looked like, wow, top seed, uh, we may not get through this, uh, but we ended up prevailing and then really played spectacular matches in the semis and finals to, uh, to win it. That's awesome. Thanks, Paul. Um, moving to Kurt and thinking a little bit more about pivotal moments. Kurt, was there a moment during your championship season that you believe helped your team turn a corner or learn a major lesson that served you well during that championship run at the tournament? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, in order to win a national championship, there's got to be, you know, a defining moment. And what was really interesting about our moment is that it wasn't obvious. It wasn't something that like we openly talked about. I think it was just a moment that we all learned. And it was really early in the season was third. I think it was the third conference match of the year. 
against Chapman. And we go down to Chapman. And at, at this point, we know we're pretty good. We're, we've got, you know, a, a pretty veteran heavy team. And, you know, we, we kind of went into it, I think, just going, this is, this is going to be a normal win for us. Um, but, you know, things just started happening. I think the day before that match, we had a starter that couldn't go. Uh, we get into warm ups. We have another starter go down and can't play. Didn't think too much of it. We actually cruised in the first two sets. I think pretty, pretty heavy wins. I think uh, by almost ten points or more. And then in the third set, we're up twenty-one uh, fourteen. I mean, we're in that home stretch, and everything goes wrong. Just nothing went our way. We kept making terrible mistakes. All of a sudden, we lose the third set, and then the next two sets are just a grind. And we get into the fifth set, which is a normal, you know matched a game to 15 and we're down big in in the early part of that game and we came back and really battled we battled to, to come back I think we were five points six points down and we tie it and we ended up battling but we couldn't get over that hump we just kept giving them a point and then we tied we actually tied it seven times and we went into extra points and ended up losing 23 25 and I just remember the emotion after that game. I don't, nobody was mad. I think everyone was just stunned. Like, okay, we had a two set lead and a 21 14 point lead to take it. We just lost. And, you know, fast forward to the night before the national championship, we just come off the court from the semifinals. And, you know, myself and Margot Arnston and Shelby Stein were sitting at the podium getting interviewed. And the reporter just looks at me and, and says, hey, coach, you know, you, you guys have, if you win tomorrow, you've won 22 matches in a row to capture a title. And the three of us sat back and we looked at each other and, and Shelby looks at me and says, coach, is that true? And I said, I, I honestly don't know. And Margo says, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. And we had realized that from that moment on that we weren't going to just presume that we were going to win matches, that we were going to look too far ahead. We weren't going to look at a conference championship. We literally looked at every match and no further. And even though early in the season, you know, the goal you talk about national championships, we actually did very openly. But once we got on that run, we didn't talk about it. We, we just kind of played the moment we were in. And, you know, in hindsight, you look back at that moment at Chapman and, and it really defined kind of the character of that team. They, they all just never, ever wanted that to happen again. And in our championship run, it proved to be perfect because we lost the first set in every single match except for the national championship. And when we lost the first set, we stormed back and beat those teams in three. And I really felt like it's, uh -oh, this is not happening to us again. And they played every match that way and credit to just a great staff and an amazing team with a resolve like no other. Awesome, awesome story, Kurt. Um, moving to Dave, surprisingly, some of the best championship memories actually don't occur on the court or on the course. Can you recount one of those fun memories from your championship run, Dave? On mute. Yeah, it sounds like a fun memory now. Um, it's a very vivid memory and a fun one at this point. At the time, it was an incredibly stressful memory. Um, it involved around a round of 16 match against Pomona. Um, and the reason that it's a fun memory is because it was actually graduation day. Uh, and Lindsey Brown was actually our only CMC senior in the lineup who was graduating. So she was, I mean, no one loved tennis more than Lindsey. And there was no chance she was going to miss the match for graduation. But the way the timing was, there was sort of a scenario that maybe she could make it. So, and you know, she's from San Diego. Her family was unbelievably supportive. Um, her whole family was there, including her 95 year old grandmother. And, you know, obviously if she could do both, we were gonna try to let her do both. I don't think I've ever let a player leave a match in the middle of a match before in my entire career and probably never will again, unless this situation comes up. But, you know, it was something we didn't really, we had to talk about ahead of time, but it's obviously not something you want to talk about while the match is going on. And, and to provide a little context, 
we were playing Pomona in the round of 16 and Pomona is a very strong program. I think that year they were ranked either fifth or sixth and because of how division three works. And I know you certainly Kurt and Paul are aware of this. We had to play a very highly ranked team in the second round. We had beat them twice early in the year, but we knew how good they were. And, you know, we were the three seeds. So it wasn't like we were any sort of dominating powerhouse at the time. Um, you know, Nikki and Lindsay won at number one doubles pretty quickly, um, if I recall. And then Caroline Cat won at two doubles. Juliet and Kyla won at three doubles. So we're up 3 0 sweep. Things are looking pretty good. I mean, we all know anything can happen in tennis, but considering we had beaten them relatively easily earlier in the year, things were looking pretty good. And, you know, we didn't speak about it, of course, but we're thinking, oh, well, maybe Lindsay can make her graduation. So anyway, Lindsay actually wins first in singles. So we're up 4-0, so things are looking even better. And considering our history with Pomona, we were probably feeling okay. I mean, you know, much like Paul, I'm always super stressed out no matter what's going on, even if I don't show it. But it's 4-0, and we're actually winning on almost every other court. But Pomona's a tough team, and, and you know, sort of you, you sometimes have these moments where you get a little stressed out and you don't perform up to possibly your capabilities. And you know, the way a tennis match works, things sort of started getting really tight all the way around. Meanwhile, Lindsay had thrown on her cap and gown. Her family and her 95-year-old grandmother went over to graduation. You know, Lindsay obviously was feeling a little guilty. She was leaving before we had actually secured the match, but, you know, graduation being important took off. And she probably felt pretty good at the time with a 4-0 lead and really us leading on, I think every court, if not every court except one. Um, so she runs off to graduation and, and, you know, she had her phone, but was consumed with graduation, of course. So I don't think she was able to sort of check too frequently. Meanwhile, the match got really close, really close um, on virtually every court, except one of our freshmen at the time, Caroline Cox, ended up clinching in straight sets in a match that wasn't super close. But if she had gone three sets, it could have got really, really, really hairy. And, you know, we were all, when, when Caroline clinched, it was just this unbelievable feeling of relief. Also knowing Lindsay wasn't even there and nobody cared about the team more than Lindsay and like felt incredibly guilty even leaving but her family did get to see her graduate. So, and, you know, she came sprinting back and was like, you know, I checked my phone. I was so nervous. I was freaking out. And, um, you know, fortunately we were able to, able to finish it off. But, um, you know, I think it was uh, a really fun memory now at the time, it didn't seem so fun. I love that story, Dave. Thanks for sharing that one. Um, going back to Kurt, and I think this might integrate some of the other coaches in this, um, but Kurt, what was the best piece of advice you received during that season or at the championships? Yeah, this is a, this is actually a really fun one to answer. Um, you know, I've been part of this department for a long time and made some great relationships. And the best part of my job is the people that I get to work with every single day. And, you know, just the championship mentality that we all share and we talk openly to each other. You know, I, I shared a wall with Jody for quite a few years. I, I've known Paul and his kids and actually coached his son and he coaches my daughter. So, you know, the best advice I got was from Paul. After we won the, in the semifinal, he, you know, shot me a text, said, let me know if you have a second to talk. And, and he just said, look, this is a big moment. I'm, I want to share some thoughts on and playing in a national championship that somebody shared with me. And, and I feel like this is the moment where I need to share it with you. And, you know, it's a big moment and, you know, no matter how good your team is, I think you're aware that, you know, there's only one team that's going to win on the last day. And uh, there's, there's some nerves there. And, you know, his advice was, you know, you're probably into your routines. You've got your walkthrough, you've got all this stuff going on, find a way to make them, remember why they do this in the first place, you know, break up the monotony, make them smile, find a, you know, find a way to let them be themselves. And, you know, we, we had gone to Target that afternoon and we bought like one of those Bluetooth speakers. And, you know, we just said during, you know, the big 10 minute break, we said, hey, go in the locker room, turn the music up as loud as possible, dance, do, do whatever you do. We're not gonna come in and into the locker room and chalk talk or talk about the match just go have some fun and 
they did it before the match. They did it <laughs> during the match. They did it after the match. It was so much fun. And I think that was just such good advice. And, you know, obviously the credit goes to the players that made that happen. And it was really fun to see, but, you know, being a part of a department where I can get that kind of advice the night before a, a title match is, is pretty, pretty awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Kurt. And, and you're spot on in that we're all spoiled that we get to share knowledge with each other um, all the time. So moving to Paul, since Kurt set you up a little bit, Paul, um, what did you feel as your team clinched the championship? You, you know, you'd mentioned that you'd been to the finals the couple seasons before. Was it joy? Was it relief? Was it a mix of both? Give me a little insight to that moment for you, Paul. Well, my answer is going to get us back on schedule here. Um, it was uh, it was 99% relief, about 1% joy. Um, and the reason for that is simple. You know, we had two phenomenal teams in 2013 and 2014. We played the 2014 national championship on our own courts, and I was convinced we were going to win that one and didn't. And um, you know, climbing this mountain with this group. Um, you know, was, uh, was a year long process, maybe a, a four year long process. And to get there was just uh, an incredible uh, relief more than anything else. I think I experienced the joy now, you know, uh, reliving the moments, uh, you know, years later and with that group, um, I, I feel that joy now, but at, at the time it was, uh, it was just a, a great sense of relief. So to summarize your and Dave's last answers is the longer it goes, the more joyful the experience becomes. <laughs> All right, um, moving back to in a similar vein to Jody. Um, Jody, what was your biggest surprise after winning the national title? Jody, you're muted. Okay, better, right? Um, unlike Paul, we weren't expected to win. So uh, I didn't, I, none of us felt that pressure throughout the season. And, and I know that can be tremendous. So um, when we won- Really nice. It, it was just pure joy. You know, I, it, no one expected us to win. The crowd was rooting for us. And uh, I just felt pure joy. And uh, it was fun. Uh, it was it was so fun to watch the team celebrate and how excited they were and their parents were and and uh, just the satisfaction of, of being the best for a year was was unbelievable. But I, I think what surprised me the most was uh, were, were all the texts and phone calls from all over the country, coaches and things, and uh, made us feel special. And I, I got to say, though, after I returned home after, what, seven days in Florida, um, it, it probably took this old coach about uh, a week on the couch to recover. But I was enjoying my week on the couch recovering. Awesome. Thanks, Judy. Um, I think Evan shot me one of the questions from the chat, and I know, Kurt, you have some input on this one, but really any of our coaches can, can chime in. I think after winning that national title, how does that impact recruiting, or did it impact recruiting for you um, as you move forward as a program? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think really the way I look at it, the impact in recruiting happened years and years before that. You know, it's not a perfect science, and you know we're evolving both as students and as athletes, and and as a school and or set of schools. And so, you know, you really look at it and say, you know, I've got to evolve with the evolution. And and so, it, it just led to us being more selective. You know, and and now we're we're definitely a destination school. Uh, you know, you can have the best on the court, you can have the best academics off the court. There's a community that's just unreal and everybody wants to be a part of that. And when you get into that spotlight and you win a national championship, then you get to tell the story of it's, okay, it's not just about a good volleyball program. It's about a great set of institutions. It's about a great alumni, an incredible community, um, great faculty and staff. And so, 
for us, yeah, we remain highly selective, but we get to tell a, a better story now. I love it. Um, in terms of, it's probably a great recruiting moment, but a little bit talking about the championship moment. One of the really cool things for all four of these programs is recently CMS was given the bid to host um, the final site and the championships for tennis, golf, and volleyball. And for golf and volleyball, that will be the first time ever that we've hosted. But Dave is the only one here who's won a title at home. So Dave, could you share with everybody kind of how special an experience that is and how our ability to host in all these sports kind of benefits both CMS as a whole, but also our student athletes? Uh, I mean, I remember just when I found out we were actually hosting, you know, I was just so excited to even get the chance to compete at the NCAA championships at our home courts. I didn't even really think about what it would be like to actually win it. Not that we weren't a strong program any, but I just was like, how cool it is to have the NCAA is at the nicest tennis facility in the country. And it'll be cool to compete that. And yes, I think by that point, we'll have a pretty good team, but it was more about just how fun it would be to be here. Um, you know, the only negative about the spring is all the students are gone, of course. So the timing is in, in, impeccable. But at the same time, I was actually very surprised uh, at how many people we did have around in terms of family, friends, and, um, you know, a shout out. Some of our biggest fans that whole week were, were Paul's players. They were uh, unbelievable, of course, within the bounds of his high standards of sportsmanship. But they were, they were really unbelievably supportive of us. And um, you know, we, we had a, what was interesting is we had starters from all three colleges, which I thought was kind of nice. Cause that also helped bring out, you know, friends and family and, and, and people from the academic side, professors, et cetera, administrators from, from all the three colleges. So that was really fun, but, um, yeah, it was just such a great week all the way around. And obviously, uh, the, the story about Lindsay's graduation was the week before, but, um, yeah, I mean, being able to play at home and, you know, just our own locker room, our own team room, and then obviously it, it worked out well for us that week. So just being able to celebrate here with everybody was amazing and just seeing the faces, even some of them surprising who came out and watched was, was, was pretty cool. Um, you know, we were the three seed that year, but it, it really at that time in women's tennis being the three seed, you could have been the 50th seed because Emery and Williams had been so dominant on the women's side and you know we had lost to those teams previously and and uh you know i just remember kind of you know as the match went on you know we were down in doubles and then you know cat won um and then caroline won and caroline won first cat won and then um kyla won in three sets one of our captains and then you know it came down to rebecca who's a freshman um, you know, but certainly the right freshman to have in that moment, very feisty, you know, not scared of the moment at all. And, you know, I kind of remember towards the end, I just kind of looked around at the facility and the people and the mountains and everything. And I was like, this is pretty cool. And it certainly wasn't guaranteed at that point. I mean, she was ahead, but, you know, she still had to, you know, finish it off on her own. And, you know, it was just kind of nice, you know, when she won the final point, I just kind of drunk, kind of drunk in like the whole sort of scene of the mountains and the facility and everything and kind of just sat there by myself for a second. But it was pretty cool to do it at home and, you know, certainly having our fans and, and you know, I think it was nice that we had starters from all three colleges on the, on the, on the court, which was kind of cool. And, you know, again, you know, Paul's guys were unbelievable supporting us. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. Um, it looks like Brian Dawson, you've got a hand up. You want to go ahead and unmute and ask a question? Yes. Hi. Thanks, everybody. This is very fun. Um, and I don't know how your sports work. I knew somebody who was on the men's water polo team at CMC or CMS, and they went and played UCLA. And I went to that game and it was like a very athletic, impressive group against superhumans who were, you know, several inches taller and uh, you know, it was, it was not competitive. Uh, and I don't know if your sports do the same thing where you go and play UCLA and USC or Stanford or any of those division one teams. And if you do, does that always help to play people who are in 
very tough competition? Uh, or if you don't do it, did you think about doing it once you were uh, on the top level in your league? Did you think about trying it out against the, the best of the best? I can I'll, pick I'll on Dave or jump. Paul. Okay, go ahead, Kurt. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to say, I know for, for our sport, um, you know, we've done a couple crossovers with D2, uh, but D1 coaches stay away from it. They don't, they don't want to have the unfortunate stigma that they, they would be created of, oh, well, you lost to a Division three institution. So there's a little bit of a, an ego there that, you know, and I can understand that, especially if they're on a one-year contract and they don't want to have that problem around. <laughs> or it just doesn't happen. Yeah, Brian, thanks for your question. Um, in tennis, you know, I think uh, the level is a little bit closer between D3 and D1. Um, I think Erica can can validate that for sure. And, you know, in the 2015 championship year for us, we ended up playing uh, Penn, uh, my alma mater, and Georgetown on a, on a East Coast trip. Um, and they're, you know, mid-major mid type, you know, top 50 type programs. We ended up beating Georgetown on that trip very easily. Uh, lost to Penn um, in a match that the score wasn't that close overall, but the, the individual matches were very close. Um, and then, you know, you brought up the UCLA example uh, the year before in 2014, we went out to UCLA um, on, a, on a Tuesday school day to play them because that was the only time they were going to play us. And uh, they had the number two team in the country in Division One. And uh, adult, they had scheduled a doubleheader. We were the first half of a doubleheader. And I was convinced that they were going to put out a split squad against us and, and get some of their lower guys playing. And they ended up playing their entire uh, A team, first string, against us. And we had a phenomenal match. Um, three of those, uh, three of their top six, actually four of their top six guys are now Nash, are world ranked in the top 300. Uh, with that team that we played. So it was a phenomenal experience. And we actually gave them a really good match. We, we ended up not winning a match, but we had some set points and um, we're very, very close uh, all the way down the line. And I will vouch for uh, Paul and Dave on that statement. And in, in the sport of tennis, our, our tennis programs tend to be competitive anywhere for the top 50 programs in the country to even top 30 at large bid type scenarios. So it is one of the fortunate things. And we're definitely a destination here um, for division three tennis because of the facility. But I would say we tend to be a destination for a lot of tennis teams uh, from all divisions as a result of how good the programs are and the facility is, so. Evan, do we have uh, another question on deck or? Uh, we do, Paige, Paige Remyard. Do you wanna unmute Paige and ask your question? Am I unmuted? There you go, yeah. All right. Uh, first of all, I wanna say that I actually coached at Claremont when I had a full head of hair and it was black. Uh, I was Mike Sutton's coach, and uh, we—I uh, was part of the program that started women at CMC. Uh, I, I've had a career in coaching, as Mike can share, but um, I, I got a little prod here to say something about water polo, and uh, I thought the explanation of Division One and Division Three was right on target. Uh, but I, I do have to say that we played UCLA. We went to Cal Poly. I'm a grad of Cal Poly, Pomona. And we went over, the Stags went over to Cal Poly and we played Cal Poly and, and lost. And as an alum, I desperately wanted to win as I'm sure Paul wanted to win in tennis when he played Penn State. But I... Uh, I never expected what was going to happen next. We turned around and played UCLA and upset them. And that was uh, quite a shock to, I think, everybody in the pool. But the, the impact today is strength of schedule, seating at nationals and all that. And you don't want to have the proverbial bad loss 
which to a division three team, that's the definition. But I, the, the one thing I'm interested in, we uh, still have a large group of coaches who uh, mentor division three swimming coaches. And there is such things are so different. Now, let me pause and say, Jody, well done, girl. I wasn't one of the people who emailed you, but I've known Jody for a long time. And uh, it's always exciting to, to make it to the top of the mountain, whether it's in your first year or later in your career. And Jody, just, uh, I, I'm so proud of you and happy for you and your team, as I am for all the Stags. Um, but what, what I did want to say is coaches now this year with COVID are having a real struggle. Everything is different. And, and my, my short of it is the people that survive this and, and are able to negotiate the course, they're going to be our leaders in athletics in the future. And so I, I would like to ask, now that you are the hunted, how are you going to get your way through the COVID and how are you going to not, uh, how are you going to protect the gift that your program has? Well, I'll preview and then some of the coaches can, can chime in. But I think, you know, what you're saying is completely spot on that it's an exceptionally challenging time to be a student athlete, to be a coach. Um, but I have so much confidence in our coaches um, because of the way we want to run our programs. And you, you heard, you know, four coaches tonight talk about it. Um, they're fully driven by the student athlete and creating an excellent experience for them. And we've had to do that in a much different and much more creative way and sometimes a very disappointing way over the past 10 months. Um, but in some ways, I think it's been really symbolic that, you know, we don't just have 21 sports teams, but we have 21 programs, you know, and programs that will stand the test of time and we have excellent institutions. So I couldn't be more thankful for this, you know, these four, but our entire team of coaches and staff around us. Um, if anything, these challenges have given me as an athletic director more confidence. So I'll open it to a couple of the coaches to touch on it as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a great point, but um, the way I look at it, you know, what, what makes CMS so special, every little thing, you know, COVID can't touch that. You know, there's still a community, yeah, we're all online and, and doing these things, you know, virtually, but you still get to sell, you know, what, what CMS is all about, and, and recruiting never stops, and recruiting is what feeds your program, and, you know, obviously there's standards that you have, both athletically and academically, but you know, CMS never goes away. And I think that's what's really fun is, you know, these institutions make it fun to recruit um, in our position. Thanks, Kurt. Um, it looks like in the chat, we have a question from Jeff Arce. And Dave, this one is um, for you. Um, in a fairly short amount of time, and, and you referenced it as being number three or number four or the number five seed in the division three tournament when you got here could have been you were the number 50 seed. Um, you went from kind of being in that range of maybe three to eight to winning a title pretty quickly. Can you talk about that process and, and how you accomplished it that quickly? Um, it was, you know, when I got here, as I said, I mean, the team was relatively strong if you if you looked at rankings, but, you know, not to reiterate, I mean, two teams had won like 18 out of the last 19 national championships in like the previous 11 or 12 or something before we won. So it was sort of a unique situation. There was a little bit more parity on the men's side where, where I came from. Um, you know, and when I got to Middlebury, there really was, you know, the team was about ninth in the conference. So it really was building from scratch. I didn't feel that I had to do that here. Um, you know, by the time I think I won in my fourth year at Middlebury and I still had players on the team who I didn't recruit who had been freshmen when I got there, but none of them were in the lineup anymore. You know, here we still had two players who essentially came into the program. They weren't my recruits. 
and just bought into everything and became phenomenal leaders, you know, Lindsey Brown and Tyler Scott. And then, you know, we just sort of added the pieces a little bit year by year. We were pretty good the year before. Um, you know, we lost in the semifinals, um, which we did my first year as well, but we were just a little bit stronger, deeper, you know, again, and, and, and Paul's been through that the, the year before in 2017, we had a pretty good team. You probably could argue we would have had a shot to win it, um, but a lot would have had to go right against the top two teams. And then, you know, there was rain, we had to play inside, which we weren't super accustomed to do. And you know, didn't have our best day against a very strong team. You know, these, you know, that's why winning a national championship is so difficult. Like a lot of things can happen. And, you know, um, the program just kept getting a little bit better. And obviously being at home certainly didn't hurt us. You know, I, I feel like we could have won with that team anywhere, but I'm not going to pretend that being at home wasn't an advantage as well. Um, but it's just about sort of finding, I had never coached women in my life before I came here. So, um, you know, and I got a, advice, a lot of advice on how to do it and then took almost none of it. And, and, you know, just because I sort of felt like I had the right way of doing things at the same time, I also had learning to do about it, but about, I always feel like I've learned to doing about coaching tennis anyway. So like the side of learning how to coach women's tennis, that didn't seem so different from the first question. And I'm always trying to learn about that. So it was just getting the right environment. And I had, you know, um, we had some really good leaders on earlier teams, you know, they didn't win the national championship. And I think Jody referenced, you know, it's, it's, it's all about building and, and, you know, those people, I remember, you know, Caroline Ward and Katie Kuzman followed every single match, you know, and others as well. And, you know, they were super invested in our success. They'd been part of it. They had played with those players. Sarah Kikina, another one was my first captain who, you know, hadn't had a great experience previously, really, but for a couple of reasons, but, you know, and then just, you know, sort of embraced sort of the new culture and, and was a great leader in my first year. And, and, you know, we actually made the final four, but we weren't really going to win a national championship. So there's so, and I'm obviously forgetting people as we all do when we do these things, but, you know, there's just, we had terrific, terrific leadership right from the get-go, who, you know, they wanted to be better. I mean, I, had, I think I had seven players on the roster my first year. So it was just sort of adding the pieces and, and making the program you know, important to them. And, and, you know, we're obviously at a place with amazing facilities and amazingly support and, you know, they can see all the competitive programs all around them. So, and teams fighting for national championships, obviously the men, the men won my first year here. So we, we definitely saw it happen. So um, there's just some little things that go in and, you know, you hold them to standards of excellence, but in the end, it's the players who win championships, not the coaches and, and, you know, you got to have the right group and sure I can help set the environment, but you know, ultimately you got to, it's what's inside of them that does it. And we've been fortunate that piece by piece, it kind of came together over time and, you know, we're not going to win it every year, obviously, but you know, we feel in a position, we can be one of those teams in the conversation every year. And, and, you know, that's what I'm probably most proud of. Thanks, Dave. I think we're going to try to take, we have two hands up and finish with those two. So um, Indira, why don't you go first? Good evening, everyone, and thanks for for being here and um, you know telling us about your the journeys your teams have been on and you have been on yourselves. I was wondering if um, each of you wouldn't mind sort of sharing with me. I, I think um, coaching with coaching, um, not only are you you teaching and helping your teams, but I think in some ways they may help and teach you about what it is to lead. Um, you know, a bunch of men or women coming from different places around the country or in different places um, academically or even emotionally. And if each of you could share like one, one thing that, um, that has stuck with you that um, one of your athletes has, has taught you, um, that would be wonderful. Thank you. I'm happy to start. So it, it ties in with, with our championship year. And, you know, one of the questions that we had in advance was, you know, uh, what was one piece of advice that you got during, over the course of that season that, that had an impact? And it actually came from one of my players. Uh, Warren would 
continually down the stretch of our championship run reminded us that we were there to have fun more than anything else. And um, this coach needed to hear that more than anybody else because I took it so, so seriously and put so much pressure on myself and probably on our players as well. So for, for one of our, our top player to remind us that, that we're out having a lot of fun um, made, made a huge impact on me and continues to have a, a lasting legacy. I, I, would, uh, I would agree with Paul. I mean, in, in basketball, all my years in basketball, I, I had players that kept reminding me it needs to be fun. And then uh, definitely with our championship and the, the few years before that, it had to be fun. And, and I think that's a major key. If, you, if you're not having fun, you don't wanna be out there and you're not gonna get better. I'll kind of share a, a, a really fun little story, um, you know, that I think really has stuck with me all the way through. And it's about the competitiveness that our athletes have. And I'll never forget the first time we got to um, the Elite Eight. It was in 2014. We had a really special team back then. And, you know, I remember we got to the banquet and there's this, uh, they have the Elite 89 award, which is goes to the student with the highest GPA. And our table, we, we were convinced it was going to be our setter, Tanner Hoke. I mean, everyone knew that this kid was was perfect. And when the award went to a player from Wisconsin, Whitewater, my team was so mad, like to the point where the next morning we couldn't even do the walkthrough because they were so mad that we, you know, like, oh, she's at CMC and she's got perfect grades. How dare a girl at Wisconsin, Whitewater? gets that award. They were so upset over that. So I just think it's neat to see that it's not just between the lines that these kids are competitive. They are just very special people. That's awesome, Kurt. Dave, yeah. anything you want to add? Uh, I mean, I could add one thing. I, one of our captains that year was, was Kyla Scott. And Kyla and I brain work sort of similar, but that also causes occasional conflict. But um, cause we're both a little bit stubborn, but I mean, she was a phenomenal two-year captain and, and leader and, and, uh, you know, she had a great year the year before and, and her senior year, she played phenomenal in doubles, but singles, she was a little bit banged up, had some injuries, struggled with confidence a little bit in singles. And I remember, um, and we talked quite a bit and she was a Harvey Mudd student. So she obviously had a lot on her plate, um, but right before I had to submit the lineup for nationals at the beginning of the tournament, she came to me because she hadn't been playing great singles and, and she didn't ask out, but she was sort of saying, look, like I would totally understand if you pull me out of singles, maybe it makes sense for me to focus on doubles. And I just was like, we're better if you're in the lineup. And, you know, she played pretty well through the whole tournament, actually in doubles, of course, but in singles as well, but in, in the final match and her final day of her career, she wanted singles and doubles in a five, four match. That's so awesome. That, that was pretty cool. All right. I think we're going to go to our last hand up, Chris, go ahead. And then we're going to wrap. Uh, thanks. It's been, it's been a lot of fun to listen. I uh, just wanted to ask uh, for any of the coaches, you know, how they go about goal setting on a year to year basis and how they sort of balance between sort of individual players desires for improvement versus you know team goals and what what's their process and and how maybe does it change from season to season if at all Paul I know you want to answer this well it's um it's a kind of a longer answer for me so I'll try to keep it uh succinct but I you know I like things in in threes so um you know, I start with my team and, and we look, we start our goal setting with, with identifying values that we would protect our team culture with. And that's where it, where it starts. So, um, you know, I, I, I let, I let the, I let them decide that. Um, and then we move on to um, some more performance and results based goals as well. So for example, um, you know, looking back that 2015 year, 
you know, our goal, I think, was to win 80% of our singles matches uh, and 80% of our doubles matches. And we, we hit those goals. So, you know, we want them to be specific. We want them to be uh, realistic, achievable, um, all of those things. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how we do it. We start with values and then we, then we get to specific uh, achievable type goals. I would uh, just add one little thing to that because we do something pretty similar to Paul, but it's funny because we try to have a pretty player driven program here. I don't wanna sort of you know, impose my, my sort of goals on them and there's obviously individual and team goals and there's short-term goals and process goals, but we've never really been scared about the destination goals either in terms of what we want to happen at the end of the year. I think there's so many strong programs at CMS. You can sort of say, oh, only talk about the process. Don't talk about the destination. Don't talk about performance goals. When you have a really good kit team, the players are thinking about performance goals. So whether you talk about it or not, it's kind of silly. It's a little bit silly to not talk about it. Um, but I found that the students here are so bright and they so, they, I sort of thought that, you know, talking about values and things like that would be a little bit of a chore. What happens is they come up with about 85 different values and about 45 synonyms for each one of those values. So if you don't hold them to only having a few, you can really go down the rabbit hole with having, you know, they're so bright and they think about this stuff and they take it so seriously. It's interesting how much they can come up with. So you actually, as a coach, don't have the problem of having them get those kind of goals and values. It's more trying to streamline into it a few basic things that they can follow because, which is, is pretty much every meeting I have at this school, but. Kurt, Jody, anything you want to add before we close? I think, um, you know, those are all really good points for us. It's a little bit different because our sport requires, you know, multiple players on a court at the same time. We get three contacts every single time. So our attention to detail has to be a little bit, it's a different approach. You know, you're talking about, you know, one player passing the ball, then the setter has to trust the pass, then the hitter has to trust the setter. So it's kind of this amazing choreographed um, just movement and stuff. So there's a lot of kind of feeling that goes into it, just that physical who's where. So we talk a lot about that um, in addition to what Paul and Dave are talking about. So it, it's a lot of work and, you know, I'm so fortunate to have an amazing staff that has various opinions that they're not afraid to share. And, you know, it's just beautiful because, you know, each coach is so special at what they do and we just let them do it. And the players love that. So it's, it's a process for us too. I think in golf, it, it varies from year to year. Um, and uh, uh, we always do talk about goals at the beginning of the year along with, with rules. Um, but I think golf stat is something that we have. And uh, every tournament that you play in, it, it talks about uh, putts, you know, greens and regulation, fairways, and all those kinds of things. And it can get even more detail. And, and we try to uh, take stats for all our uh, our practices, when we play practice rounds, we like to see those stats. And so uh, we take a lot of time in the midseason. We take our goals from, hey, I, I think in the championship season, we were uh, really poor on par threes. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I think we were really poor at the championship, but they were really hard par threes. Um, so uh, it, we, we take our goals from what we see there too. And, uh, and then each player, they have their own individual goals. And, uh, and, and as uh, everybody else has said, said they're, they're very competitive and I think they can be often too hard on themselves, but. Thank you, Jody. Well, I probably should have warned Evan and everyone else that a golf coach, two tennis coaches, and a volleyball coach, there's no clock in any of these sports, so we might go a little bit over. Um, but hopefully everybody here tonight um, enjoyed hearing from these four and understand why I have one of the most awesome jobs in the world, um, get to work with them. But I think also hopefully everyone is excited and inspired as these are these are the folks that are mentoring our student athletes um, now and for years to come. So feel really blessed to be a part of this tonight and appreciate the opportunity and all the stag and Athena love. So 
Thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone.